share stream. Very good. Hello and welcome back. This is the 13th session, I believe. Yes, the 13th and final session to the study of the Persian Bion. Uh, welcome back, everyone. And I'm going to start the screen share and we'll get right into this. Good. I unfortunately cannot get my screen to share. <laughs> Having a technical problem. I apologize. Uh, this. This is wonderful. <laughs> so hold uh, on a second. Let me see if I can get the document up on my laptop and then I can share it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. So get, give me a minute here. Um, let's see. Okay, not that one. Try this one. Okay. <clears throat> See. Okay, I've got it up. Now let me get over here to screen share. All right, my screen, my uh, screen sharing is disabled. So you have to enable me so I can do it. You should be able to do it now. Okay, let's see. No, I don't want downloads, you silly thing. I want, where is this? No, that's not it. Uh, ah, there it is. Okay, there we go. So, Good evening, everyone. I, I was asked to answer two questions at the last time we were together. And I was asked to provide a, bibli a bibliography. And this document answers both questions and provides a bibliography. It's all in one place, okay? And if out of this class, if out of this final meeting for the book, there are additional requests, <laughs> um, I'm very happy to answer whatever I can. I will add them to this document. And then Jeremiah can notify you um, or make, make it possible for you to get the updated version of the document, okay? So I'm prepared to, to, uh, to continue with that. Um, I wanted to, uh, I, I don't think it's premature for me to say this because I think that uh, uh, both John and Jeremiah have indicated their, their interest in this. Um, I think we've decided that we're going to offer a follow-up course on the completion of the Persian Bayon carried out by him whom God shall make manifest himself in the eight, year 1861, 62. 
namely Baha'u'llah's kitab -e And I have had the, the, the great um, uh, 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 news to share with you that uh, Mr. Dunbar has agreed to have me use the notes that he prepared for his study classes on the Kitabi Gan at the World Center, which was published in abbreviated form, but the complete set of notes um, I was able to acquire. And he said that I was welcome to use those notes to create my own notes for Kitabi Gan so that we would have a great scholar <laughs> um, informing much of the content. And there are a number of other very fine commentaries that have been written by Baha'is. So I'm gonna to try to study those and, and include those as well. We were thinking of, of doing this at some point in September and that it would last probably one or two months if, if we, divided up the same sort of way and have the same amount of quantity per session. But that's still in, um, that still hasn't been decided. And we'd love your input. If you've got any ideas, um, if for example, we have a number of you who want to take this follow-up class, but you can't start until October or November, then we'll start in October or November. You know, that's fine. Um, if you, prefer to go once every two weeks rather than once a week, that's something we can also uh, take into consideration. So uh, please be very um, forthright in sharing your views with Jeremiah and John um, as far as the structuring of that class. Um, so um, why don't we go through the, the three things that I've prepared for today, and then, and then I will take any of your questions, any of your comments, and uh, as well as anything that you want to say about this experience of reading a book from beginning to end and studying its, its, um, its major themes it's minor, minor themes, what, what you thought of that experience, what you, any ideas you have for its improvement. And I'm very straightforward with you about that. I, I'm, I am far from an infallible teacher. There is none, except for Baha'u'llah and Abdullah. So um, I, I know I can get better. So please help me to get better by offering your comments, your, pers your perspectives. So the first thing I was asked is to find where Baha'u'llah speaks about the next manifestation of God. And it took me until about a couple hours ago to find it because I knew I'd read it many times. I just couldn't figure out where. And you know, with searches, when you use searches and documents, you've got to get the right words, at least some of them, or else you don't find what you're looking for. It can't be the subject because it doesn't rec recognize subjects. It recognizes words. So what I found was uh, there is a fairly long passage in the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, which, by the way, should be required reading of all Baha'is, and actually, we should read it every like five years just to make sure we remember what its content is. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, in that excerpt, Baha'u'llah makes the following statement. He says, I am not apprehensive for my own self. My fears are for him who would be sent down unto you after me, him who will be invested with great sovereignty and mighty dominion. And then in another document, he wrote, by those words which I have revealed, myself is not intended, but rather he, 
he who will come after me. Deal not with him, he adds, as ye have dealt with me. This is, um, I, I, bring this, I bring this out because there are not a lot of references in the Baha'i writings to the successor to Baha'u'llah. But the Guardian collects the most important ones and puts them into this essay and puts them in the context of both the writings of the Bob, which then he cites. He cites right after that. You see this a passage here, it says, it is clear and evident, he writes in the Persian Bayan, that the object of all preceding dispensations hath been to pave the way for the advent of Muhammad, the apostle of God. And then he builds his argument going all through his dispensation and him whom God shall make manifest and the manifestations that will come after him whom God shall make manifest. So this continuity of progressive religion, you know, every the followers of every religion have gotten stuck into believing that their prophet was not the only the greatest, but, but the last. And we are so fortunate to have not only in the writings, but in the interpretation of the writings by the master and the guardian, clear, clear statements. This is not the last. This is the greatest of all history. Of all previous manifestations, this is the greatest one. And that's because of our development, because we're ready for it. We have revealed ourselves to a degree corresponding to the capacity of the people of our age. Those are the, those are the, that's in a statement of Baha'u'llah and Adrianople that, that's right up there on your screen. So, um, so that was the first question that I was asked to, to answer, and I was glad that I could answer it in such a way with authoritative texts. There's nothing esoteric about the way the Guardian has presented this, this principle of the faith, and he makes very clear you know, here he is in the last paragraph saying, in the light of these clear and conclusive statements, it is our clear duty, he, yeah, he really uses that word clear, clear duty to make it indubitably evident to every seeker after truth that from the beginning that hath no beginning, the prophets of the one God, the unknowable God, of the one, the unknowable God, including Baha'u'llah himself, have all as the channels of God's grace, as the exponents of his unity, as the mirrors of his light and the revealers of his purpose, been commissioned to unfold to mankind an ever increasing measure of his truth, of his inscrutable will and divine guidance, and will continue to the end that hath no end, to vouchsafe still fuller and mightier revelations of his, his limitless power and glory. So the second theme I was asked to quote had to do with, so do we have to like read all these books and like remember the Bob said in one point, you know, there are 4,000 verses here and the 700 there. And, you know, like, oh, you know, I know you're all thinking, my gosh, this, this is a tough life. These Bobbies have to spend half the night or maybe all the night you know, reading these verses because otherwise they'll never get any job, any work done during the day. And here we go. Baha'u'llah just smashes it. Now, here he goes. For were a man to read a single verse with joy and radiance, it would be better for him than to read with lassitude all the holy books of God to help imperil the self-subsisting. And he just spells it out. Read ye the sacred verses in such measure that ye be not overcome by languor and despondency. You know, the Guardian, this passage was translated by the Guardian, and his pick of language is so, it not only sounds really good, but if you look those words up, they are so precise in their meaning, and they say exactly what we need to hear. 
which is don't don't ruin your health <laughs> reading the word of God. That's not its purpose. Its purpose is to uplift. It's not to burden you. It's not to burden the soul. And here he says right here, lay not upon your souls that which will weary them and weigh them down, but rather what will lighten and uplift them so that they may soar on the wings of the divine verses towards the dawning place of his manifest signs. This will draw you nearer to God, did you but comprehend. So that's in the Kitabi Akdas. It's in paragraph 149. And I included the second one after it, just as a little bonus. Because uh, as important as it, is, as it is for us to do this, it's just as important that we do it with our children. Teach your children the verses revealed from the heaven of majesty and power. And then it talks about them singing in the Master Koskar. I want to tell you that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a classical singer. And I've spent many years of my life singing sacred music in churches. The most divine sound I've ever heard in my life is to hear children singing sacred music in a church or cathedral. It's unbelievable. It just, you just, you get chills, <laughs> right? Your whole body gets feeling that, you know, that you're getting lifted up to another place. And someday, you know, someday the Baha'is will have beautiful Mashrika Oscars in every community. But in the meantime, we need to teach our children to do this so they do it in our living rooms. So they do it in our, in our kitchens. So that when, when we get together for feasts and we get together for deepenings and we get together for any holy day, that we have children who are going to chant the verses in front of us. Because when we, when they, when we experience that, we'll, we'll know why Baha'u'llah gave us that gift. We'll understand it. Because it's so, so very uplifting. Uh, this is so wonderful how he says about whoever hath been transported by the rapture born of adoration for my name, the most compassionate, will recite the verses of God in such wise as to captivate the hearts of those yet wrapped in slumber. Uh, again, I think we, we would do more effective teaching by singing the praises of God to people and having our children do it, then most of our lectures and talks and even, uh, you know, uh, best, best sort of behavior of helping people out. Because what people need most of all is inspiration. Now, the bibliography. What I've done is I've created a bibliography that includes all of the uh, texts that have been provided by the World Center and uh, those which have been translated by various Baha'is. Um, I'm, I'll go through them very briefly. You know about selections from the writings of the Bab, but I wanted to make clear that the, that selections has quite a bit of variety in the tablets and addresses, for example, that is in the beginning, he's got tablets to kings. Individual kings receive tablets from the Bab. He wrote a tablet to the Sultan of, of the Ottoman Empire, then at that time, the largest Islamic empire in the world. And that, that empire had one ruler, and that ruler was a king and also a caliph. He was the head of the Sunni community of Muslims, which at that time was about 90% of Muslims. And it is pretty close to that today. The, the, the Muslims who believe in the 12 Imams are actually a very small community of Muslims in comparison to the Sunnis. But he also wrote, of course, to the Shah, and he wrote to the prime minister of the Shah, Haji Mirza al-Qazi. And he, and he wrote to 
uh, general epistles to the clergy of Iran. So, but in, in addition to that, you have excerpts from the Qayyum al Asma, which is a commentary on the Surah of Joseph in the Quran, and which was his first work. It was the verses of the Qayyum al Asma that convinced all the letters of the living to become Babis, every single one of them, from reading the opening verses of the Qayyum al Asma. And it was the Qayyum al Asma which was presented by Mullah Hussein to Baha'u'llah, sent specifically by the Bab to go, to go see him, who, who saw the opening verses of Qayyum al Asma and said, The promised one has come. So, this is a really important book, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, then we see the Persian Bayan excerpts from the Seven Proofs. That's the Dalail Sabe. Sabe means seven. Dalail means proofs or evidences. Uh, then there are also excerpts from one of the very last works authored by the Bab, the Kitab Asma, and there are excerpts from various other writings and prayers and meditations. A really precious compilation of, of writings. Um, now, also another collection was published uh, a few years ago. Uh, edited by Todd Lawson, who wrote his PhD dissertation on the Qayyum al Asma and the Surat al Bakara, which means the, the commentary on the Surah of the Cow. And uh, Omid Gayagami is uh, uh, a much younger man who is. Uh, uh, forging his way in in the scholarly world and he's a, a wonderful scholar and um, has a deep knowledge of the writings as well and they co-edited this collection of writings of essays on the writings of the bob now these are some of them include tr translations some of them don't but i i really felt that you needed to have access to this now not all of these contributions to this volume are available here on, on, in this virtual fashion. Some of them you would have to actually purchase the volume or take it out from the library. There are probably a number of libraries that have copies. Just remember to look for us for a most noble pattern. That's what it's called. Okay, it's published by Gee, I don't remember who it was published by. Um, then, then we have um, articles which include translations, an anal analytic survey by Muhammad Afnan uh, on the Arabic Bayan. Then we have uh, the Khutbah Zikriya. Um, and with a translation by Vahid Brown, uh, Risale Fissuluk, with a translation by Todd Lawson, The Farewell Address of the Letters of Living, which is included in The Dawnbreakers. But I wanted to just, you know, it's, as, as a statement, it's very important, I think, to, to, uh, to read it and to understand it, and so I stuck that in too. Then there's a tablet, one of the tablets to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Abdul Majid was his name at the time, which is translated from the original Arabic by Nijati Al Khan. Um, then there are several papers and a dissertation by uh, Todd Lawson, who is now retired from a long career of teaching Islamic studies and also Babi and Baha'i studies at the University of Toronto and who has tons of, <laughs> of um, terrific uh, 
uh, uh, videos up on YouTube. So you can learn a lot about his study and his, and his un, insights into the writings of the Bob by, by looking on YouTube. And then these are all links to where you can get them from, uh, from Baha'i Library. Then there is a, uh, uh, there's a explanation of an important tablet of the Bob that you um, may very well have seen at some point. It looks like a five-pointed star. It's called the Star Tablet. And Mujan Moment, um, who is an acclaimed Baha'i scholar, has written about that. And then you have uh, one of the most knowledgeable scholars on uh, the Bob's writings is named Vahid Behmardi. He's a professor of Arabic at the University of Beirut. And um, uh, he and Will McCants, who is um, uh, much younger and who um, has made a career also in the, in the in Arabic studies, uh, translated this uh, work that was written by Vahid Behmardi originally in, in Arabic, I believe, on the stylistic analysis of the Bob's writings. Then there's the book of the, the will of the Bob. He wrote a will similar to Baha'u'llah, but much shorter. And that uh, was translated by a committee at the World Center. And then finally, there's a survey of English language translations of the writings of the Bob. Now, the next thing I had to put as a separate category. And the reason why is because Stephen Lambden is a British scholar who has spent his entire adult life studying the writings of the Bob. He's done work on the writings of Baha'u'llah too, but his principal dedication has been to the writings of the Bob. And on his website at the University of California at Merced, there's this huge, long list of, of Bobby writings that he has translated, explained, and which are available to any reader who cares to go and, and look at them. Um, it's, um, I have to tell you, this man's scholarship is just, it's just, there is no way to compare him to anybody else because he is, he's spent so many years doing nothing else. Um, he had an accident when he was in doing his graduate studies and that accident has made it impossible for him to have a full-time job, but it, it earned him a stipend from the British government. And then, so he's been able to devote himself to scholar, scholarly work. And the results are really quite stunning. So here are the, this is the list that goes on and on and on and on and on. And um, I had to put it in there be, because um, uh, not, not, <laughs> not to overwhelm you, but just to give you an idea that there are people who have actually made a lot of the, Baha, the Bobby writings available. And we just have to go and look, we just have to go and read. It's, it's, it's that simple. They've done all the hard work and he's the number one. There are also Persian Baha'i scholars who have studied and explained the writings of the Bob in Persian, but I haven't created a bibliography of them because I don't think any of the members in this group are fluent in Persian, but if you are, then um, if you need some help in finding who those sources might be, please contact me and I, I will, I will uh, see what I can do. Now at the very end of the list, of all these extraordinary resources, you see it goes on for pages after page. Of course, I, I rather than write these all out myself, I, I simply copied what was in his, uh, um, his website. So it has all the little 
pictures and so forth, which is really nice. Um, I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. Here we go. So, and then to conclude, I've included the three things that I have contributed that I've translated. One is the Arabic bayan, which I did a very long time ago and probably needs to be redone um, from the French of Nicolas. Uh, then the thematic analysis and summary, which you already have, have been uh, studying. And the seven proofs of the Bob, the Dalo et le Sabé, also translated from the French of Nicolas. And all three of those are, of course, at Baha'i Library. Um, I, uh, I would, uh, I, the only reason why I offer my translations uh, to anybody is because there aren't anything, there aren't any others in English. There is sometimes excerpts that you can find there. Um, like for example, even with a Persian Bayan, there's excerpts that were translated by people who have more knowledge and expertise than I do in the languages. But um, they aren't complete. And so what I've tried to do, I've tried to do as completely as possible. And I'm sure that when somebody comes along and does a better job than I have, um, that mine will just be forgotten. And that's fine. <laughs> because after all, I'm just trying to uh, assist English readers to be able to gain access to these wonderful books. So I've now covered my territory. And now I'm looking to hear from all of you about um, uh, why am I showing this? You know, oh, I see. Stop share. I have now stopped my sharing. I see that in, um, in the chat, you will see this document that we just went through. So you can copy that. And now I'm waiting to hear from, from you about, uh, ab about lingering questions or comments that you never made but want to make now, or what is it that you liked about this class and what didn't you like? I don't want to hear about this a year from now, when somebody says to me, oh, you know that Peter Terry, he's such a bad teacher, you know, and he picked such a difficult book. I don't wanna hear about that in 10 years. I wanna hear about that now, <laughs> okay. Well, Peter, I would like to just start off by thanking you and uh, tell you I have one comment and, and it's not anything on the class itself. It's, it's actually an observation that I've come to realize myself personally is that the, these texts are more approachable than I at first initially realized. And so that's why I'm thankful for you for having done this. Hmm. You know, there's a, uh, um, there's a, a very short passage in the Kitabi Agan, not, not to jump the gun or anything, but um, there's a passage in the Kitabi Agan where Baha'u'llah says that the writings, the divinely revealed word is, is meant to be read. And the purpose of reading it is to understand it. And that reading without comprehension is of no enduring value. I think that that is the best shot in the arm that you could possibly get because he obviously believes that we can do it. We don't, he abolished clergy. That's a really important point. 
He abolished clergy. He said, no, now humanity is mature enough to go out and read the word for themselves and understand it. And if we come from a point of view where we're not, we haven't been confident, it's totally natural for us to not be confident. We're surrounded by a whole world that tells us that we have no business opening our mouths unless we have PhDs in the subject that we're going to speak about, right? And which is the equivalent of a priesthood. We have a universal priesthood of people who are who are the experts. And, and just plain folks like us, what do we know? Nothing. That's what we think. And then Baha'u'llah comes along and says, no. Trust in God. You do have the capacity to understand this. Because if you didn't have the capacity, how could you be held accountable for your behavior? Right? I mean, the whole purpose of, of the writings of the manifestations are to guide us to a better way of life than we would get to by ourselves. So how can we be known for doing that unless we do what he asks us to do. It's all about taking action, really. Well, you can't take action if you don't understand, right? So he's telling you, yes, you can understand. And it was designed from the beginning to be understandable. So I'm glad that your, your experience is to feel that it's more approachable. Because once you feel that I can do this, you'll find instead of like giving up or putting yourself down, you won't, you'll just be like, no, I know how to do this. Maybe you have to do it in little bits and pieces and you can't do it for hours at a time, but you'll find the more you do, the greater your capacity will be. Yeah. So, all right. Now, I look, I'm looking at all those names up there, and there's some real talkers up there. So, come on. Let's hear from you. Um, you, you, be, you better be careful what you ask for. Because <laughs> I am a massive talker from an oral culture. Uh -huh. And I have spent the last week throwing myself around um, pulling my hair out and saying, how can you appropriately respond to something that you've waited all your young Baha'i life for and you've been forbidden your own language? All of a sudden, this presenter and the wonderful Clearwater Baha'is give you a window of opportunity um, and then you're going to both thank the presenter, who is very humble, but who is a musician who knows about connectivity, who knows about these melodic things that connect people, this will perpetuate. But I also want to invoke something very special. Please forgive me. I want to invoke from, um, I want to, in loving memory of Robert Turner, mm. um, ask that when we are propagating, when we're sharing with our friends, and I've looked at the Clearwater population, so there are very few Native Americans, there are more Afro-Americans, but I just want to, in, in, in love of this, to say that I don't know how many First Nations peoples have attended this. Um, I don't know how many among us are First Nations people. And you've picked the 73-year-old pioneer from way back between Australia and New Zealand, the mandate of the guardian for our countries, who's like at the closing years of her life, who has waited since she was a teen, who wanted to be a revolutionary. Um, and I don't, and it's not all the text. It is, you know, I can't contain what has been shared in these sessions. And I am so ever so grateful um, because... Um, I've been on fire, I've tried to get my assembly involved, um, and I'm not going to stop. And it's not just about the content, it's about the spirit that these, um, this pioneering spirit has been engendered here. And I particularly want to um, say a loving thank you to John Stiltz's beautiful wife and child, 
and to Jeremiah Adams, his beautiful wife and his children, because he's growing. And so is John Stilts. They, they used to come on with hats and all sorts. But over the years, I've watched them and they've jolly well grown in front of my eyes. I feel very nan-like toward them. So yeah. thank you so very much. And that's enough from me. I could go on and on, um, but I would like to, there are no words. I just want to say I feel very blessed to have attended. Thank you all so very much for putting up with me and my oral so Sharon, are you in New Zealand? You yes, see, I, I live between Australia and New Zealand because in 1952-57, the Guardian mandated us. He said, look, if you can have one Aboriginal person, they're priceless, right? So we actually have, thank goodness for advent of divine justice, there was a UK believer who informed me, who's been a pioneer to that country for 40 years, that out in bush, we actually have a um, moiety of Aboriginal people who don't couldn't do tribal law or any law, but the law that they do is the Katabiak Das. Now, how wonderful is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very, it's wonderful. I, um, I, I, have you heard of the name Sylvia Ashton Warner? No, not really, because I've been out, I've been at, you know, where I've been out there is places people wouldn't want to go. We're talking semi-arid desert. We're talking uh, really remote locations. So I'm not really up with the play. So Sylvia Ashton Warner is, was a New Zealand woman from New Zealand who taught Maori children how to read. She taught preschool, very, very young ones. Cool. And um, her, and she had really what seemed like miraculous results by following a method that, that, that was entirely organic, that just came out of the experience that she had with these children. And what she, the basic idea was, you teach them the words they want to know and yes. learn those words instantly. They never forget them. And she had five and six year olds who were writing. <laughs> and you, wow. all, you know, if you've had children and grandchildren, you know that getting kids to write can be quite, quite, quite a task. You know, <laughs> what they do nowadays is they want to watch videos. And what mm -hmm. they do in previous generations is they want to play with blocks or with dolls. So now. Now, so I'm bringing this up because I think you are the person who has been selected to take take this, take the Persian Bayan to the Maori people. And the Yay! People Thank Australia. you, God. <laughs> You're the one. You're do the you, one. Do, you do know that uh, uh, until just recently, um, we have been forbidden our own language, but the but Persian, Farsi, is very similar it has a resonance that is very close to Māori itself. But because of colonisation, we've become English speakers who are trying to revive our cultural language. So, and also I'm on what I call a hikoi of hope. That's kind of like a spiritual mission um, because our people are in, um, the Guardian said if we didn't get to them early, they would become entrenched. And that's exactly what's happened. Mm -hmm. So in October, which I hope you don't have this continuing thing in October, because I'll be on the road um, on my on my hikoi of hope um, to reach out to Māori and, uh, and find out what's happening. What about what's happening in terms of their integration, both within and without? And also now, I it, it's not going to be an inter, a, a lecture, but I can, um, I do things like I give postcards of the whole, you know, my methodology is so not intellectual, but it is heart to heart, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I can, I can take this stuff and, and inspire other people to be enthusiastic because this is a huge mahi, that means effort that you cannot do on your own. The more mm -hmm. people that can mm -hmm. do this, the more mm -hmm. blessed um, our, um, we at Tangata Whenua, First Nations people. So, okay. and I looked at the map of Tampa and everywhere because I was so, I spent, I had spent the most emotional week. I've been beside myself. One, to kind of address you and Mr. Fazy and that experience because I want to tell you about him because in 1987, I thought that I had spent two or three hours in closeted circumstances in a very private 
um, situation with Mr. Faisy, only to find out that he had ascended way before that. I was in Haifa with my husband, Ian John Leonard, my daughter, who was nine, Javab Leonard, and my beautiful son, who was three, Nasir Habib Leonard. And, um, and, and why I want to just quickly share this with you, it's very personal, but Mr. Faisy had this ability, and nobody in my life, because I came from racism, I had a horrific upbringing because our country was in transition, standing there in 1987 with whom I presumed and could swear was Mr. Faisy, and what he did for me and does for everybody, he enabled me for the first time in my life to recognize my true self, the one best beloved in the sight of God. And when you recounted those attributes that are very unique, they all had different ones. Mr. Collis Featherstone, who looked after us, he had other ones, but those are particular to Mr. Faisy. So immediately, even though you are a beautiful opera singer, you're far remote from me, I instantly felt, oh my God, there's my brother, you know? Mm -hmm. So look, thank mm -hmm. you, thank you, all of you. Thank you, Sharon. Come on, there must be some big talkers out there besides uh, Sharon. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we are, uh, I, I, it, it is an oral tradition. And, and you know, we talk a thing to death. Uh, uh, we don't feel we've given it enough unless we talk it to death. You understand me? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a kind of a, um, like if you, you know, you're, talk, you're actually worshipping it. And, mm -hmm. and vocally, that's what you do. So forgive me. Mm -hmm. So who's next? Who's the next? Hmm? I know there's somebody who wants to say something. I, you know, maybe you should just call on people. Let's, let's just <laughs> let's just call on people and and then they'll have to say something. I think Alex is ready. All right, Alex, go. Well, I certainly can. I. <laughs> But I, I, it's probably a good idea to call on people. I, um, I echo Sharon's thoughts and feelings and gratitude. Uh, so I've got a, a question and then, and, and then a comment about the course. Um, I believe you gave us a percentage or an approximate percentage of the laws in the Kitab Akdas that come directly from the Persian Bayan. Do you, do you know, what is that, what, what is that approximate percentage? Well, I, I, I should. I don't like giving uh, misleading information, but it's pretty clear to me just from having read the Kitabi Akdas from cover to cover, and having read the and even before that. Remember when the synopsis and codification of the Kitabi Akdas came out in nineteen seventy something, seventy four maybe it was. Um, I read that, and so. Um, I'm fairly, I'm fairly sure that uh, well over 90% of the laws of Baha'u'llah in the Kitab Yaqdas derive from the Bab. But there are a few that don't. There's no house of justice. Hmm. There's no house of justice, local or universal, in the writings of the Bab. That I know of, there's none. And there is no, so there is also no provision for supplementary legislation being enacted after the manifestation is gone. This is completely unique to Baha'u'llah. Hmm. Jesus didn't give this. Muhammad didn't give this. None of the previous manifestations gave this. And um, although it's, uh, it's, it's, we don't know what the pattern of, of human existence is going to be like in, in thousands of years from now, but it may very well be that an institution that is enacting supplementary legis legislation that is supplementary to that revealed by the manifestation is going to be a permanent feature of our, our existence for, for, for you know thousands and thousands of years to come, because it just makes sense. Once you reach a certain level of maturity, you have to be able to respond to the times. 
You just can't live according to one code of laws because that law, that code is never going to be complete. And Baha'u'llah was so, such a genius about this that he even left laws that he could have elaborated on and he left them to the house. If you look at the question and answers to the Kitab Yaqdas, you'll see law after law where he leaves it to the house. Mm -hmm. The genius behind that is that whatever the house enacts pertains only for a period of time and they can change it anytime they want. And so if a law is enacted by the house and they find that the human reaction to it is just not a positive one, that's something they can adjust very quickly. They don't have to wait for the next manifestation. So, uh, but I would say probably uh, at least 90% of the laws of the Kitabi does. And this is also proof of the very close relationship between the Bab and Paola. And that was, you, you had asked us to think about kind of the impact of, of, our, of this exposure to the Bayan. And like Sharon, I've had an interesting week knowing that this was coming to an end. I think, and I was trying to think what, what has been the change in my understanding of the Bob. And I think that um, throughout my Baha'i life, I would identify the Bob in his role as the herald, in his role as the gate. Um, and but what what this this class and and the flow of reading these the writings from the Bayan, the impact it had on me was, I think, to have this brand new love and appreciation for the Bob in his role as the twin manifestation with Baha'u'llah. It seems somehow to have elevated the Bob for me. A twin is the side by side. Yeah. You know, we understand Baha'u'llah is the supreme manifestation, but in this, in this, with this title as the twin manifest, it just, the, the richness of that um, has just been a complete surprise to me as a Baha'i. Um, you would and the other aspect was to do this once a week. I, I was not able to keep up with the full reading of, of the Bayon. I wish that I did. I would read, ultimately, I, I would read your notes and then things that stuck, uh, stuck out at me at that reading, I would then go read that in the Bayon. Uh, but it, it was such a break as Baha'i so much of what we're doing now is, is community building we're trying to systematize the dynamics of growth and that kind of thing and that somehow doesn't feel it it, it has less a sense of the mysticism or the um, the spiritual fragrances of the rest of it so to have this two-hour respite in the middle of each week with you what really started to have an impact on me and, and I didn't realize that until the, the class that you were not able to attend because you were ill, because we all stayed for an hour and a half. Wow, that's great. And, and we talked about this, about the impact of the class. We, we had questions and answers for one another, but we, we started to just talk about the impact of this class and what it's meant. Um, so I don't want to go on and on, but I, I wanted to say something to you. This was, this was particular to your personality, to your style. You said something one night that... Um, <sighs> It even right now it's catching me, and I don't exactly even know why. Um, you you were talking about that how the Bob uh, gave us this law, this teaching to recite the verses every morning and evening, mm -hmm. and and you were sharing some thoughts about that, and you said to, you were think, saying to think about the impact of reciting the verses at night, and you said that we begin our dreams with the words of God in our mouths. Mm -hmm. And that was such a gift to me. I don't know why it's affecting me the way it is, but it does. And uh, I had texted to Jeremiah, you, you're, you're, you are among these modern Baha'i thinkers that I'm so grateful for. And um, so I'll just leave it at that and, and thank you very much. Dear Alex, uh, I, I wanna tell you that uh, uh, that, uh, that experience of of 
not just starting your, we all understand starting your day with prayer, of course, that orients you for the day, but you want to get oriented for the night because our, our brains are so full of, of things that they could focus on. They don't have to focus on spiritual things during, while we're sleeping, but boy, when they do, we wake up in the morning and, and we feel the difference, you know? We really feel the difference. And not only that, it makes us receptive to have dreams that are spiritual dreams. Mm -hmm. You know, Baha'u'llah talks about them in the seven valleys, about the spiritual dreams that show us what the world, the other spiritual worlds are all about. We get to have this experience every night if we connect with the spiritual worlds. And that comes much more readily when we're in a prayerful mood, when we turn in the right direction. Yeah. So I understand that that, uh, because that, that dimension of the spiritual is beyond words. I mean, it, it fills us up with emotion and we don't know <laughs> what to say, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I hope that um, I hope that we will continue this because I think that um, I think that I, I'm, I don't think this. I am sure <laughs> that when people do this with their lives, that they take the time to actually study the writings that come from the manifestation of God, it changes our lives for the better. You know, and, and we may have spent years getting little snippets here and there, and it was never satisfying. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, we, you know, it's like we'd spend years, and the only time that we prayed was, you know, the short obligatory prayer, if we didn't forget to say it. And, and, you know, and then we go to feast and we'd have like three prayers and that's over. And now we can go on to administration. And so we're not, we're not getting any spiritual nourishment, but we don't even know it. We just, we just know that something's really lacking. And then you jump into this ocean of revelation. I mean, you know, Bob wrote so much compared to the Persian Bayan but we jumped into the deep end and, and, and it does, it changes you. It changes me. I probably changed everybody who participated in it. Lucinda's here. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> You made it. I didn't think I was going to make it. <laughs> Ray, Ray. So are you ready to talk or do you want someone else to talk first? Well, let somebody else talk first. I just Okay. Be nice. <laughs> All right. So who else is there out there who could be? Uh, Jeremiah, you just need to turn on the valve. Okay. <laughs> so that they have to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen. Nobody, nobody's talking. Kathleen <laughs> is talking. Oh, good. Oh, Kathleen. I'm yeah. talking now. Oh, yes. I'm talking. Okay. Well, hold on. Let me get a picture of myself up so people can see me. Okay. Yes. I have not had many questions because I don't know. I I have a problem with asking questions because once you read something by Baha'u'llah or something of the Bob or Abdul Baha. What do you say? You know, there's really nothing more to say until you have some period of reflection. But I did want to mention something that became part of my spiritual practice as a result of taking this course. The Bob said two things. He said that we must visit the graves of the departed once every 19 days. Uh, my husband passed away last November, and for me, going to visit his grave was just um, very painful. 
And I decided that on the first day of the feast, I was going to go visit the, his grave. And I did go, and it was a very different experience because I knew I was doing something that the Bob had asked us to do. And I, I can't really describe it, but it was better. The other thing he said we should do uh, is that he said that we should write down the name, one of the names of God every day. Yeah. And I'm a paper and pencil person, so I have a day timer. And since then, I've been opening up my day timer and I look at the prayers or I look, I actually have a list that I downloaded and I write down one of the names of God, just to kind of keep that in my mind. So that was two things that have just become absolutely a part of my day um, as a result of taking this course. That's, um, you see already, Kathleen, from the responses of the three people who have already spoken, how each person was touched in a different way. And that's just simply who we are. Human, every single soul is completely unique, <laughs> you know? And, and um, you know, I would never, I would, I don't think as, as beautiful as what you've shared is to me, and it might actually inspire me to do those things, but I didn't, I didn't think of those things. They didn't pop out for me myself. It came, so you've, you've been a messenger for me, a messenger of the text, because the text touched you in a certain way. Actually, those two things were like being hit between the eyes with a ping pong ball. <laughs> that was... <laughs> <That's great. laughs> yes well and and also because you were saying to yourself i can do that right mm -hmm. right i can do that and i know it would be good for me to do it and i think this is one of the reasons why we're encouraged to continue to read the word of god is because that gives us an opportunity to find the new thing that we need to do. Uh, it's more likely to come from scripture than any other place. Thank you. Thank you. Sharing. Who is our next victim? <laughs> Go get them, Jeremiah. <laughs> so I just uh, have to say, if Jeremiah asks you to un unmute, beware. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I guess what we can do is if... Uh, no one else has anything else to share. We could wrap up for the evening, um, but I'd like John. No, I know Lucinda do. wants to say something. Give us a minute she here. Just, she just <laughs> needs a minute to collect herself. Oh, I'm sorry. I just she, sat down. <laughs> she didn't even knew that she didn't even know she was going to be here. See, oh. that's that's the, her 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 difficulty. So, yeah. um, oh, I see Joyce wants to say oh, something. Oh, good. Have Joyce go. <laughs> Well, I've been pretty quiet in this class, which is not necessarily like me if you knew me. Um, but I am really, really appreciative of, of having the opportunity to be here. I had said at the beginning of the class, because I'm a retired teacher, I kind of look at life through that lens. And I had said I felt like a kindergartner who wanted to learn about the stars. And I ended up in an honors high school astronomy class and I was completely <laughs> overwhelmed. Uh, but uh, you know now I'm more like up to maybe third grade so it's okay. <laughs> um, I appreciated what Jeremiah said about he felt like he could now um, approach books. Uh, I've been Baha'i for 50 some years and when I came in that's all we had was books mm -hmm. and and we that's how we learned about faith was through books and whole books and we did whole books 
And over the years, I think within the faith, we have, have shifted more to a Ruhi approach, which has a time and a place, and, and it's, it's good for its place, but we've gotten away from the books. And I think that's reflective of our culture as a whole. People don't read anymore. And um, I'm glad that we have the opportunity to get back to that because there's something about seeing the writings in context and, and going at them in depth, um, in depth within themselves rather than say in depth with your life. And I think that's, I'm, I'm glad to see that there are opportunities to get back to that. Um, I was glad to hear about Sylvia Ashton Warner. I was, I used some of her work in my work with young oh, really? readers and writers. And one of the things that the Baha'i faith is changing is our approach to education and, um, and how we train up young children. And I think that that's gonna be a piece of, of what we do. Um, when I came into the faith, you know, there was the Bob and Baha'u'llah and the Bob was the forerunner and he was just kind of single dimension. Um, but he is really now, I have a much greater understanding, not only of the Bob, he's now multidimensional as well as a much greater understanding of the faith and where the faith comes from um, mm. that I didn't have before. So, so that I'm, I really appreciate that. Uh, and I appreciate all the contributions of everybody in the group. And I was in that meeting when you weren't here and, yeah. and it was really good. And there's a lot of wisdom in this group. And, um, and I appreciate people sharing that. I also appreciate having the notes that you sent out. So oftentimes teachers want to guard those, you know, it's like it's proprietary. Um, and I appreciated the fact that you sent them out because it helped me organize my thinking. Um, so just thank you. I've gotten an awful lot out of this and I've been able to share it with people in my community and beyond my community. And, and they're going, oh, really? Oh, really? So the ripples are spreading out there. So again, thank you for that. Thank you, Joyce. It's wonderful to hear from a teacher. Um, I, I'm obviously a teacher, but um, uh, a teacher who's had uh, many years of classroom experience, and uh, and 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 who has discovered the special gifts of the Baha'i writings and the Babi writings that uh, that guide us to a new understanding of of education, because spiritual education is it. That's that's the most Im important kind of education, um, and. Uh, Maybe maybe we'll have uh, uh, an opportunity to talk about that theme at some point in the future. I I think that there's a lot of interest now among uh, Baha'i educators, but also among parents and grandparents to to um, to mine the Baha'i writings and find everything that they can possibly um, uh, absorb that will guide them in their interactions with the children they love because they're, they are pure, precious souls and they are riches beyond compare. I, you know, I, I became a father very late in life and I'm so grateful that I did late in life because so often parents are young and if they haven't gotten a really good grounding in the spirit when they're young and they have children, their kids don't benefit from that, right? They don't get that dimension in their education, their upbringing. But because I've lived for many years and hopefully absorbed some of the truth of the revelation is that my kids get that from me. And, um, and I... And I get back from them this, this confirmation that there is no, nothing more precious than a human being on this planet. There isn't. And that all of the nutty ideas that people have filled our heads with, that there are, there, there's anything to compete with the children are simply, <laughs> they're mistaken. <laughs> what can I say? So thank you for, for that. And um, are there... Are there more people that we can um, call on or 
do we have um i i think i have asked everyone to unmute so everyone okay yeah all right okay i'll go <laughs> okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> it's been a very uh crazy day <laughs> <laughs> the energy that's released when you uh, work so hard, it seems like it's connected to us, this work we're doing in the Bion. Um, we had a, a Persian uh, couple move into our area today. Oh, <laughs> okay. wonderful. Uh, they've been, the COVID uh, displaced them from China. And ever since then, they've been going around the world, trying to find a place to land. Uh -huh. And uh, they made it across the border this morning and made it here this afternoon and had to give the truck back that they have all of their things in. And so we all came and unloaded them. And <laughs> it was pretty exciting for our community anyway. Uh, so that- Where do you uh, live? I, I live in uh, Leavenworth, Washington. Oh, Washington. Yeah, right in the center of the state. Listen oh. to Alan. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it, it's, uh, it's, they, the, everything that happened kind of was really hard. And then at the last minute would open up, you know, and then it'd get really hard at the last minute it open up. And so it's wonderful to watch this faith, you know, this, this wonderful, whatever it is to, it just does that you reach and it opens up and it's, uh, it's really wonderful. I have really enjoyed this class. I, I've just been giddy after every class. <laughs> As you know, <laughs> I bubble around. Um, I, uh, uh, reading does not come easy for me. And so, uh, but I am very determined. <laughs> and so uh, that's my gift. And uh, with the Bob, the Bob has always had a very special connection with me. I've always been very connected to his, the little tiny bit of writings that are there, but it's like he's, he's all around me all the time. Um, he's just there and the howl is too of course but when i read the writings of the bob and especially through this process it's like i know what that is you know oh i know what that is you know it just clicks for me for some reason mm. and and then when i go to the howl's writings then i can see oh look there it is oh it's there too you know and i because i I've, I've been able to kind of connect the dots um, in many different areas, especially like what Alex was talking about at night before you go to bed and do your, you know, read the writings. And I love the 700 writing, you know, 700 phrases and <laughs> all these little terms. Because for me, th that quantitative thing helps because it's like, well, how much is some, uh, you know, <laughs> I like 700. And then I'm like, well, I'll, I'll do my best because I'm not supposed to burden my soul, but it's okay to do this, you know. It just, I, I'm kind of all over the place. I apologize, but um, it's, uh, it's been a very uh, invigorating, exciting uh, process. Um, when I read the um, medium obligatory uh, prayer now, and there's phrases in there that I hadn't, you know, I knew, you know, you read them and you know, and everything's wonderful. But when you read them and you have that context, Mm -hmm. just opens it up it just mm -hmm. is very powerful i i can't stress that enough uh it was it's kind of surprising how powerful it is because you know you know what supreme means when you read it but when you read the by on and he really explains really what it is and then you read it it's like wow i mean you know it's just like mm -hmm. op it opens it up so mm -hmm. much more and uh, all of the intricacies, I guess, that he that he that he sprinkles throughout the bayon, you know, the Persian bayon. He just he just keeps adding a little and a little and a little, and it just it's not too too much. It's it it never felt I never felt overwhelmed. I never felt um, like oh I can't do that, you know. I never felt that at all. And and like the 
you know, like um, the last, what is it, Nina? She was saying that uh, she's a school teacher and people don't read. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I love to read. I'm a hunter reader because <laughs> I can, I, if I'm looking for something, I can read a lot, but I can't, I'm not a book, you know, I don't read from cover to cover usually. And this cover to cover was a big accomplishment and it made me feel like, oh, you know, this is something I, you know, this is a new way of doing it that I can do. And um, I, um, I want to encourage people that don't read that much or are dyslexic and have trouble, um, trouble reading. I have to translate all that I read because <laughs> it, it goes into a big bucket and then I un unfold it. And so um, I just, um, just work with it. And in this process, it, it wasn't an issue at all. I didn't, it didn't, I didn't notice the bucket nearly as much. It just flowed and it was out there and my heart knew what it was talking about all the way through. And so um, it's, uh, for me, it was a very, it was so easy to read it. Um, it was very exciting. I don't know how to explain it exactly, but, um, but I want to encourage people that don't think of themselves as being able to read a big book. This is different. I don't know. Anyway, I absolutely, uh, I, I, I was trying to write down ideas of what I gleaned out of this class. And what came to me was it was, it was like we're going down a waterfall and then at the bottom of the waterfall or even on the sides, that mist, you know, that comes up. Mm -hmm. It's like, I felt like, you know, we went all over the waterfall and I'm kind of up in that mist. And mm -hmm. one of those little droplets and you look down and you see all that water below, you know, mm -hmm. so you have a perspective, a new perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just uh, very much cherish this class and I really appreciated you guys, all of you, all mm -hmm. of the input everyone has given has mm -hmm. been just, uh, Wonderful, wonderful. And thank you all for coming to this class all the way through to the end. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lucinda. I'm, um, you, you have a, a gift for speaking to the heart. And uh, uh, it's really, uh, it's very moving. And uh, so I, I, uh, I'm, I believe in continuity. Okay. <laughs> that one of the reasons why we, we did this, we read this book is because I was convinced that if we just do it right. And we read the entire book, we're going to get so much more out of it than if we, than if we just go and a little bit here, a little bit there. I mean, like, for example, how many times do people read the advent of divine justice? It seems like every few years that Baha'is are, you know, encouraged by the institutions to read the advent of Baha'i justice because it has really important themes. But in, in my experience, what actually happens is they go and read a few passages here and there. They don't read the whole letter from the very beginning to the very end. And um, I had to do that not a couple of years ago because we were preparing the text of the advent of divine justice for, for an app that, that we're creating. And I had to go and check the, the narration that had been done by this terrific narrator and uh, actor from uh, BBC. I had to check every word and he made lots of mistakes by the way. But anyway, in the process of reading, I had to read the entire book and not just read it, but hear it read to me. It was fantastic. I mean, <laughs> it was just, I, I, like one thing I'd never known before is that at the very end of the book, the Guardian translated one text after another from Baha'u'llah. Most of those texts had never been published anywhere else. It's like this tapestry of Baha'u'llah's words about enjoining teaching with confidence. 
And it was stunning. I mean, literally, and it's right there in Advent. I mean, if you didn't read the whole letter, it meant that you didn't get the power because the power was at the end, you know? <laughs> and so, um, so that continuity seemed really important to me. And that's why I, I suggested, and what you missed out on in the beginning was that, um, that with Jeremiah and John's blessing, um, I'm going to be offering that we complete the Persian Bayan. And we complete the Persian Bayan with the Kitabi Igan. And that we do that in um, some time when it's convenient, as convenient as possible for all of you. Because I know that you, you are people who can do this. You can start a book and go all the way to the end. And I don't want to lose you. <laughs> you know? and, and I just think that for us all to have that ex shared experience of approaching the Gitabi Agon with already this foreknowledge of what the Bob talked about in the Persian Bayan is going to be really rich experience. And in another experience that we can share with a lot of people. Um, so that is, uh, I would, if I would love for, for each of you to, uh, let Jeremiah and John know what times are good for you, whether once a week is practical or whether we need to change that to, you know, once every two weeks or whatever. And also, uh, Peter, I think we can keep yeah. the one day a week Wednesday times because we are already doing it and everyone's used to it. Let's just keep yeah. that. Okay. Okay. Uh, the only reason I would suggest a change is if we find that, you know, 80% of the people in this group can't do that because their, their schedules change and they can't, they can't meet during the week, for example. Of course. You of know. course. Yeah. Cause we're in the summer here and we, uh, you know, a bunch of this, class has been in the summer and people's schedules in the summer are different. And, but, um, well, I guess what we'll do is we'll come up with a proposed schedule and then we'll run it by everybody and we'll hope that it, 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 it will be good for everybody. Okay. And like I said, great idea, great idea. My 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 preference would be to to start with the Kitabi Agon fairly soon, within let's say a month, because the Bayan is fresh in our memories. And there a month from now, it's still gonna be pretty fresh. If we wait for, you know, too many months, there'll be all sorts of other things that have gone into our memories and are messing with <laughs> our bionic impressions. <laughs> uh, but that's my, just my two cents. I don't, I don't know how busy people are at this time of year. Um, I see most of you don't look like uh, of an age where you have children going to school. <laughs> so maybe you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> uh, I do. I have a three-year-old and an eight-year-old that are going to be going to school starting in a few weeks, but I'm not going to let them going to school interfere with us going to school, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we'll come up with a plan. We'll propose it to you, and and then we'll we'll go with it. And what I also what Lucinda missed out on, but I'll just reiterate for everybody is that. Um, Mr. Dunbar very uh, graciously uh, approved me using the notes that he created for the study classes on Kitabi Agon that he taught for years at the World Center. So this is literally for decades. He was there as a house member, and before that, as as a, as a counselor, um, and he. Uh, that was the book that he loved to teach more than any other, loved to study and teach. And 
Uh, he's written a book about it that was published by George Ronald. But I wanted to take from the notes, the original notes of the classes that he gave, and then come up with notes that we could share in our class. So they won't be a complete du duplication of what he did, but it's well informed by his wisdom and his knowledge. And uh, so that's where that goes. Um, I thank you all for, for coming today and um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Peter. So thank you for that. your really, Thank you very much for all of your very touching comments. With, with that being said, it, it, we will uh, we'll be in touch. And if you guys need, you can just reach out to us through the, uh, the website or you, the majority of you, I believe, have the emails, but uh, you can always get back in touch with Peter or with me or John through the website. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who joined us and we look forward to seeing you guys soon. So where are the emails? Um, if you, there's a contact form on the, um, the Clearwater Baha'is website. So if you go to clearwaterbaha'is.org, there's a contact form. And so that comes directly to, to me and and then I can got all the emails. Okay. Yeah, and I have all the emails. I thought and, you deleted, so yeah. No, no, no. Um, now, if you guys want, I can, with everyone's permission, I can send it to other emails to you guys so that you guys can continue this. But that that will have to be. I'll have to receive your permission from each person individually. So just reach out to me. Uh, if you guys have questions and we can continue the conversation then. And you know that you have permission from me to write me anytime you want, because I've given it to you several times already. <laughs> and I'm never changing my mind. Okay. So if I should die in the meantime and continue to understand that you can, you know, talk to me anyway. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Good Thanks. night. Aloha, Paul. Aloha, Paul.